you can collect shells and look at this. In 2003, Nepal moved his lab from Chicago to the University of California, Berkeley, where he was appointed professor in two departments. The, one is not enough for a great scientist. The Department of Molecular and Cell Biology and the Department of Integrative Biology. He held endowed chairs and served as the co-chair of both departments, not at the same time, but he was the co-chair for each. He was also the faculty curator of the Essig Museum of Entomology at UC Berkeley, where he intends to eventually donate his vast collection of 50,000 butterflies. In fact, you may have read about Nippon recently on the front page of the New York Times, where his images of rare part male and part female butterflies, um, known as gernandromorphs, were pictured in February. Despite all his success at UC Berkeley in forging new research directions, particularly performing experiments to satisfy his long-held love of butterflies, Nippon made a bold career choice. In 2018, he moved his entire lab across the country to Woods Hole, Massachusetts to become the new director of the Marine Biological Laboratory, or MBL. Since 1888, the MBL has been a renowned center for international research and education in biology and environmental science. It's a private nonprofit institution now affiliated with the University of Chicago, where Nippon is once again a professor. Nippon had previously educated many, many young scientists at the MBL uh, as an instructor and later as the course director for um, the famed embryology course that's held there every summer. It's been held there for well over 100 years. It's only fitting that an exceptional scientist like Nippon Patel should lead this historically important institution into the future. And the MBL is indeed lucky to have him. As we are now, fortunate to hear, whoops, sorry, to hear about Nippon's continuing quest into understanding the physics behind the beautiful patterns in biology. So Nippon. All right, well, Marnie, thanks very much for that very complete introduction. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. As Marnie said, um, I was a staff associate here from 1990 to 1994. And this really is like coming home for me. This is a place that's really near and dear to my heart. And I think really, more than anywhere else, really fostered my desire to be really inventive, imaginative, and creative in the science I do and gave me the freedom to really do that. And for better or worse, I've never lost that desire to really go ahead and just go for it and be creative in the things I do. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is yet another new sort of endeavor that I've had in the lab in the last few years. So I should say, you know, why do I work on butterflies? It's kind of strange that I'm the director of the Marine Biological Lab and I also work on butterflies. But um, it's one of my first loves in biology. And so I can still recount exactly how that happened. So I was eight years old, and I found a dead tiger swallowtail in my backyard. And um, it was in almost pristine condition. And I read up on how to mount it, and I mounted it. And then I convinced my mom to sew me butterfly nets. And the next thing I know, I'd started a butterfly collection. And I've always kept going with that butterfly collection, having an embarrassingly large number of them now. Um, and, I've, and for a long time, it was just a hobby. But I've endeavored to find ways always to turn my hobbies into my science. I have to say that one of the reasons I work on crustaceans is I like to scuba dive, too. So, um, but the butterfly collection was something that always fascinated me. And I was always trying to figure out how to really make scientific contributions with the butterfly collection. And um, Marnie sort of pointed out one of the things, which is I started a project with these butterflies that are part male and part female to understand details of how wings are put together. But I'm going to talk to you today about a very different project, which is in the title, which is trying to understand the physics of color. And I'll tell you why it's a problem of physics as I go along. But as Marty mentioned, you know, my, my, one of my driving ambitions is really to try to understand 
how it is that you generate diversity of organisms, right? And this is a very animal-centric slide. I can say I actually took all these pictures. Um, and it just represents kind of the morpho morphological variation that you get in organisms, which is all the more exciting now because we know that many of the genes that are involved in the development of these animals are actually very, very well conserved. And so how do you take those genes and generate very different shapes and morphologies and things like that? But um, one of the organisms that I think that provides a great inroad into this are butterflies. So probably everyone, you know, the, the great thing about giving a pub public lecture on butterflies is you don't have to explain what butterflies are, right? Everybody understands that. They're a really charismatic group of organisms. And you can just look at them and appreciate the beauty of the colors and patterns that are in them. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do today is explain to you a little bit about how they generate color but the colors that you see that are green and blue, okay? Because it turns out that, as I'll explain, those are rarely made in the way that we normally think about color, which are pigments that absorb, absorb certain wavelengths. They're made in a very different way through light refraction. And I'm gonna try to describe a little bit of that and our inroads and to try to really understand how a butterfly builds those things. But I thought what I'd start with is tell you a little bit about why butterflies and moths have colors and patterns. So what is the function of those things, okay? And I, and I thought I'd illustrate with some examples. So these are a few ideas or, 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 or known reasons that color and pattern are important to butterflies and moths. And what I'd like to do is actually just go ahead and illustrate examples of each. And you get some appreciation for why these butterflies and moths have all of these colors and patterns. And I'm gonna focus on things that really protect them because they are predated upon by things like birds and lizards and spiders and other insects. And so how do they avoid that predation? So the first one is something that probably will be familiar to most people, which is camouflage or sort of cryptic coloration. And so this is an example of a moth that lives here in North America. And you can see that these four wings have this brownish color with patterns on them. They break up the outline and they sit on bark and they blend in reasonably well. This is one of my favorite examples, which are dead leaf butterflies from Southeast Asia. So the underside of them for all the world looks like a dead leaf. So having patterns in them that look just like dead leaves and even clear spots in them that look like mold spots that have gone through, right? And this is just six of those of all of the same species collected in one location in China. And what I wanna show you here is that there's also intrinsic genetic variation in the pattern. So no two individuals actually look exactly alike. There's about seven different genetic loci that control the pattern, and they mix and match aspects of that pattern to generate lots of variation. So predators can never learn any specific aspect of the pattern, and there's always some sort of leaf that they blend into, okay? You'll often see this presented as a really interesting example of natural selection, right? But you'll often see them in museums sort of glue to a branch. They never ever sit on branches of trees <laughs> like that, right? Because that's not where dead leaves are. Dead leaves are on the ground. <laughs> and they sit on the ground and they blend in, okay? This is a different species. This is a melanitis butterfly from Australia. But the same thing, and I can say if I hadn't seen where this butterfly landed, I never would have taken this picture because I never would have found it in the leaves. But not only do they do things like blend in, but they have interesting behavioral adaptations. So this butterfly will actually lean its body into the sun so that it casts no shadow at the same time, okay? So amazing levels that they go to to blend in, okay? Another example, that this one's maybe not as, as obvious to people as a, what's called a flash and dazzle that butterflies use to avoid predators. And a good example of that comes from these blue morpho butterflies, which probably many of you have seen in butterfly houses and things like that these bright, spectacular, metallic blue butterflies. Now the blue color is probably an example of sexual selection. The females are brown, the blues are bright, the, sorry, the males are bright blue, and the females select for that bright blue color as a sign of good genetic health of the, of the male. But of course, this puts them at some danger because they're really obvious, okay? So what do they do? So the underside, though, is cryptically colored. It's very much brown, okay? And so what happens to these butterflies is if you start to chase them, they start flashing this bright blue color. And then what they'll do is they'll immediately sit down on the ground. And you're, you keep looking for this bright blue flash. So you keep just wandering along, expecting to see this blue butterfly somewhere, and it's just sitting at your feet. They're hiding, okay? So that's an example where they can actually use that flashy color to their advantage to actually then have a cryptic underside and then hide from you, okay? 
Another thing they do with the pattern on their body is deflect attacks away from vital parts of the, of the animal itself. So butterflies can do pretty well with a large chunk of their wings missing. As long as most of the leading edge of the forewing is there, they can fly reasonably well. And remember, they are only the adult form, right? That, free, that adult butterfly that you see flying around is the final adult form. It only has to live a short while to reproduce. And so as long as it can keep flying and find a mate, it's OK. So how can it keep from you know, attacks um, hitting vital parts? So here's a good example. These are little hair streak butterflies that you find all over the world. And what you can see, hopefully, is that there's not much color and pattern near the head. But there's, in fact, this false head at the other end where all the color and pattern is localized. And they have even these little things, and hence the name hair streaks. They have these little extensions on the wing that look like little antenna. And in fact, when the butterfly sits down, it'll hold its head still. And it'll rub these wings up and down so this false head is moving and those antenna are moving. Okay? But actually, when you collect these butterflies, they often look like this instead. Okay? <laughs> so some small lizard or something has taken a bite out of it. Okay? But you notice they have very short abdomens, so no vital parts get bitten off when that happens. And the butterfly can fly perfectly fine with this piece missing from it. Okay? And this is exactly the whole function of that pattern, is to keep the attack away from the body. And you can see it might even be able to get one more round in there of deflecting the attack. Okay? Now, sometimes this does get carried away, and you get butterflies that look like this. right? And this probably is a little bit of sexual selection gone a little bit crazy. And they have this long, long tail. But these butterflies live in the neotropics. And some of the predators in the neotropics have learned to watch the direction the butterfly flies, and then figure, well, it's flying this way. The head is at this end. So these butterflies actually initiate a 180 degree rotation just before they land. And then they walk backwards. Okay? <laughs> and you'll see that their antenna are striped like their legs, and they'll put their antenna down to look like another pair of legs, right? So this the you know, there's this always this arms race between the predators and the prey. Okay? Another example is to startle the predators. Okay? And a great example of that come from these owl butterflies that have giant eye spots on them. Now, often, sometimes small eye spots are designed to deflect an attack. But these big eye spots, the idea is they look like another predator. So if you're a little lizard, right, and you suddenly come across this, of course, what these look like are the eyes of a larger predator. And so then you think twice before approaching this thing. And it gives the butterfly enough time to get away there. Okay? Another good example actually comes from this moth that I showed you before. So its, it's four wings are cryptically colored, but when it gets startled, it does this. Okay? And so that holds the predator still for just a second, saying, well, wait, what is this that I found? Right? And it gives the moth the chance to get away. Okay? Finally, some butterflies and moths are actually unpalatable. So usually what happens is larvae, they eat plants that contain toxins. They sequester those toxins in their body. And then to advertise that they're toxic, they often have very bright colors. Um, and the birds and lizards learn that that pattern is actually a warning coloration. Okay? And a very famous example that you're all familiar with are monarch butterflies, which is larvae feed on milkweed plants, sequester the toxins in their body. Monarchs actually have very tough bodies, so birds can actually um, taste them. And so a naive bird will actually taste the monarch, and then you'll throw up because the toxin is actually really noxious. And throwing up is a great single trial learning paradigm. Right? If you eat something really bad and it makes you throw up, you don't eat it again. Right? The only exception is teenagers and beer, where that doesn't <laughs> seem to work. Okay? But otherwise, this works really well for butterflies. And another famous example are heliconius butterflies. These live in South America. And they all have these beautiful black colors with, with bright reds and oranges and things like that on them. And the birds and other predators learn that this is a toxic coloration pattern, and they learn not to eat it. Okay? But of course, once that happens, then you get mimicry. So you get other birds, or sorry, you get other butterflies and moths that actually then mimic that pattern and then also obtain uh, protection from that. But there are actually two types of mimicry. So there's what's called Batesian mimicry. And this is probably what you usually think of, which is that you have an unpalatable butterfly and a palatable one mimics that. Okay? So that obviously, the palatable one now gets protection. But there's also something very common called Mullerian mimicry, which multiple unpalatable butterflies will mimic one another. And the idea is that just saves the bird from having to learn so many patterns. Right? So instead of having to taste each of the different 
unpalatable patterns. It learns one of them. All of the species of butterflies have converged on that pattern. And so not as many of them have to sacrifice their lives to teach the bird or lizard. Okay. And so these are some common examples. Again, the monarch that you know about. And so its mimic is called a viceroy. Okay. And it's actually still not clear whether this is a Batesian mimic or a Mullerian mimic. So it appears that viceroys themselves are actually slightly unpalatable as well. Okay. And this is one of my favorite examples. These are actually butterflies from my collection. So these are all butterflies that are heliconius butterflies, and they're unpalatable. Okay. These are all moths that all mimic those heliconius butterflies. But these moths are also unpalatable for a completely different reason. Okay. But you can see the advantage that then both of these species are protected by having convergent patterns. And then this is another example. These are all relatives of monarchs that live in Southeast Asia. They all feed on milkweed, so they're all unpalatable. These are all completely unrelated swallowtail butterflies that mimic those. And in fact, these are actually the same species. So there's just two different female forms that mimic two different butterfly species, two different unpalatable species. OK, and then, and then I told you the heliconius butterflies, which have these bright, beautiful colors that they use to warn off predators. But these, what I'm showing you in this image is remarkably just two different species that are shown in each side. And you can see that a given species has many different um, geographical forms that have very many different patterns. But in fact, where they co-occur with the other species, they're always co-mimics with each other. So in those geographical locations, the local predators learn that as the dangerous pattern. Okay? Why they've evolved so many different patterns isn't actually clear. But geneticists have been able to use this to great extent to actually understand the genes that separate the two color patterns between this species and between this species, and then look at what happens in convergence. How did they both arrive at the same color patterns? OK, so what I want to do, though, is tell you a little bit about how they really generate those colors. So there's a lot of really exciting research done by a number of really outstanding labs that are focused on the patterns that you see in butterflies and moths. And that heliconius example is one of the places where people have had really, really good success in really getting down to the genes. But I want to talk about the colors okay, and tell you where the colors come from. So if you zoom in on a butterfly wing, what you see are all these scales. So you're always told, you know, don't touch the butterfly because you're going to damage the wings. right? And what comes off on your fingers right, that looks like all these little colored dots are these scales. Okay? So what are scales? So scales are the dead remnant of a cell that had grown when it was in the chrysalis, when it was in the cocoon. And so this is an extension, a giant extension of a cell that comes out. And it dies before the butterfly actually emerges from the chrysalis. But before it dies, those scales are imparted with color. So the scale, just to give you an idea of the size, so a scale is about 50 microns across and about 300 microns long. And I'll give you a little scale bar here just to understand, right? Just, just everyone remembers. So just as a, as a measurement of that, right? So a human hair, which I think everyone always says, oh, how is thick is it relative to a human hair? So a typical human hair is somewhere between 50 microns and about 150 microns, OK? So these are about that sort of, in that sort of scale range, OK? Um, but then if you look at these individual scales, in this particular example, each of these scale cells, before it died, it synthesized pigment molecules that were deposited. Okay? And that made them white, black, brown, yellow, those kinds of colors. Okay? And those are pigment molecules that were put in there. And then when the cell died, those pigment molecules remained. And that's the color you see. So butterflies can't regenerate any of this pattern. right? Like I said, the cells are dead. If you rub them off, that's it. Okay, but that's where they generate their color. And you can think of these like little pixels on a screen. So each one is a distinct color. And that pattern overall of pixels is what gives the pattern of the wing. OK, so pigments are very good for making things like red, yellows, oranges, blacks, and things like that. So we sort of think of that as the longer wavelengths or the, that part of the rainbow. Okay? And so how do pigment molecules work? So pigments are then molecules on the order of tens of nanometer angstroms, right? Which the whole idea is they absorb specific wavelengths of light and then reflect the others, and that what gives color. So a good illustration of that comes from highlighters. So if you think, well, how does a highlighter work? So your yellow highlighter, for example, has this molecule in it, which has this structure. This, you know, it's a it's a hydrocarbon, and what happens is is that the chemical structure of this allows it to absorb blue light. 
Okay, and then what's left to be reflected is red and green wavelengths, and your eye perceives that as a yellow color. So that's how pigments work, usually by absorbing one or two particular wavelengths of light, and then what's reflected back to you is what gives you the impression of color. But it turns out it's very hard to make pigments that absorb long wavelengths of light, which is what you need to do to make green and blue. Okay, but there are plenty of butterflies that are green and blue, so how do they do this, right? And it's actually, it turns out that it's very difficult to make pigment molecules that can absorb, for example, red light. There's one really big exception, and that's chlorophyll, which is why the world is so green, because that molecule is very good at absorbing red light. But it means, actually, as I'll show you, there's a strong selection to be green in butterflies as a camouflage color, okay? So what I'm gonna do is really try to t explain to you how you get greens and blues, okay? And that's, and this, this phenomena is not unique to butterflies. So in many organisms, making green and blue color is not a pigment, but it's what we call a structural color. It's made by light refraction. So the iridescent blues and greens that you see on bird feathers are generally made that way. Even human blue eyes are not a pigment color. They're a light refraction phenomena. The iridescent colors that you see in fish, and even like these blue faces in monkeys are not from a pigment. They're a structural color. So what is a structural color? So one really good way to illustrate that is to think of a soap bubble. Okay, so the soap doesn't have any color to it. So why does this bubble have all of these colors to it, right? And so what it is is it's an unusual phenomena of light that's because light has wave-like properties to it. Okay, so what happens? So when light goes from one type of media to another, the first thing that happens is it changes speed. Okay, so light, so you've always heard, you know, light travels in a vacuum 186,000 miles per second, right? So that's how fast it travels in a vacuum. But when it hits something like glass, it actually slows down, okay? And when it does that, two things happen to the light. So this is a laser beam of light hitting a piece of glass that's right here. And so one thing that you see is the light changes velocity, it changes angle, right? So this is part of the phenomena of when light moves from one media to another. It's what causes it when you look into a lake and you're trying to aim at a fish, right? You aim at the wrong spot because of the bending of the light as it goes through the media. But the other thing that can happen, which hopefully you can see here, is there's a reflection that occurs. Some of the light gets reflected when you change the refractive index, that speed of light, okay? And so some of it gets reflected. And so one of the things that happens with soap bubbles and other, and also show you another phenomena, so when you have a thin substance that light is traveling into and it has that change in refractive index, what will happen is some light is reflected from the top surface and some light is reflected from the bottom surface, okay? But I've depicted the light as waves, right? And those waves of light now can interact with one another. And so what can happen is if the light, those two waves of light are in phase, that's called constructive interference, and those add up to each other, and the amplitude doubles. Well, if the amplitude doubles, the light actually looks four times brighter to you if that happens, okay? But if the waves come out, and they're out of phase with one another, they cancel each other out, and that wavelength of light disappears, so the energy cancels out, okay? And what happens is, is that different colors of light have different wavelengths. So this is in the order of 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers. And a nanometer is one times 10 to the minus ninth meter. Okay, so now we're down at a very, very small scale. Okay, so very, very thin materials like a soap bubble will do this. Okay, and the math of this was actually well worked out a long time ago. So you all remember from taking physics, right, at some point, these equations, okay? Um, and you don't, and the, and the details aren't important really here. All you need to know is that it depends on having a material material of two different refractive indices. And in our case with butterflies, it's gonna be the air, and then it's going to be what a material called chitin, which is a polymer of sugar, which they made all their exoskeleton out of. So the hard part of insects, their surface, is made of this material called chitin. And they make their scales out of the same material. And it has a very high refractive index of 1.5, so light really slows down when it goes into it. And so what, mean, what it means is there'll be a, a reflection off the top and the bottom surface. And what happens to the light depends on solving this equation. So if you look, what happens is depending on this thickness of the material, right, certain wavelengths of light will undergo either constructive or destructive interference. So when white light hits, which is all these different colors, certain colors will actually be canceled out after this phenomenon, and others will be amplified. And it depends on the thickness of this material. 
Okay? So if you can make a material that's right around half the thickness of the wavelength of light that you're interested in, you can amplify that color and actually effectively destroy other colors. All right? And that's basically how structural color can work. You can make it even brighter by repeating these layers over and over. So you'll get multiple reflections off of that. Okay? So, and I'll show you now an example, in this case it's a moth, that actually has only one pigment color in it, which is black, but it can make every color in the rainbow by this phenomenon. Okay? And it's this moth here called a sunset moth. So the only pigment in it is black, but you see every color of the rainbow because all of these scales are just multi-layers of chitin in the air. And to make different colors, it's just changing the thickness of those chitin la layers. Okay? And it can tune that to make whatever color it wants. Okay? So that's one way. So what about like blue morphos, right? This spectacular, incredibly metallic blue color. What do they do? So we can show that it's structural color in a really interesting way. So remember I said that it depends on the refractive index of the media of air going into chitin. And so what you're going to see in this movie is we're going to drop a drop of acetone onto this wing. Acetone has a refractive index of 1.3. So now you're going from 1.3 into 1.5 instead of 1 to 1.5. So it changes the math in the equations. Actually, the math for this one is a little bit more complicated. Um, but it changes the math of the equations. And what it's going to do is create a different color that undergoes constructive interference. So instead of blue, now it's green. Okay. And that's because now all I've done is displace the air with this material, which has a different refractive index, and it's bright green. If I were to drop xylene on here, which has the same refractive index as the chitin, it would just turn brown, because it's just the color of the wing. There isn't any other color to it. Okay? So how do these, um, so what, what actually happens here to create these, this particular nanostructure? So if you zoom in on the scales, this is what they look like. Okay, and this is, this is the scales, again, at higher magnification. You can see they're stuck into the wing by a socket, and there are these ridges on them. All scales actually have these ridges on them. They're part of the structural component of the scale, whether they're pigmented or not. But in these morphos, these ridges are extremely tall. And if you cut through the ridges right here and you look at them on end, they form these giant Christmas tree structures. And you can see how small they are. This is one micron. So actually, the spacing between all of these branches of the trees and the spacing between the trees themselves is just right to get this massive constructive interference of blue light. So that's why they're blue, okay? is that sort of very complicated nanostructure, which creates incredibly bright blue light. Now, the beauty of it, that experiment I showed you is we drop that acetone on there, they're green. But the acetone will just evaporate away. Air will go back in, and they'll just go back to being blue again, okay? because you haven't really changed anything. You just transiently change the equation, but now it can go back. OK, so now there are, here's an example of green. So these are these little green hair streak butterflies that you should actually be see flying around here really soon. They're hard to find, though, because they're green, and they blend into the vegetation beautifully. Okay, They're a great camouflage color. So how do they make green? So this is one of my favorite examples. So if you look at one of these scales, they seem to have little green facets on them. So this is just reflecting white, li white light off the scale, and you just see this green color coming back at you. If you crack one of these scales open, they have this honeycomb pattern inside of them. Well, that honeycomb pattern is actually this shape here, right? And this shape is uh, it's called a gyroid. And this is, again, one of my favorite examples, because this was in, 1970, in the 1970s. This was a theoretical mathematical shape. So it's a shape that divides space into two equal yet separated spaces, OK? And it's this complicated curved space defined by an equation. And then people discovered it exists in the real world inside of the scale of these butterflies. And at this size that the butterfly makes it, it's just perfect for getting massive constructive interference of green light and destroying the other wavelengths of light. And so that's how they're green. Okay, So this is great, um, sort of understanding these kinds of things. And, and all of this work that I've shown you so far was done by optical physicists. right? So in fact, it seems that everybody who's a physicist who has access to a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope will take the scale off of some butterfly they're interested in, measure, make all the measurements, and then do the math and tell you why it's the color it is. Okay? And then they'll often, if they have the, the grant from the Defense Department or something like that, they'll actually spend like $100,000 and make a square millimeter of it out of completely man-made material using really nasty compounds and chemicals and things like that. And then they're very happy. 
but they never seem to worry about, well, how did the butterfly make any of these things? And so as a developmental biologist, that's what I'm interested in. So how in nature can you make something like this, right? Because you're asking to make something that's on the order of 100 or 200 nanometers, extremely small, but also very, very precisely. Because if you're off by 10 nanometers, you're the wrong color, and it's not going to do you any good. So how does a living biological system, a single cell in this case, actually make material like this? And so what I'd like to do is to sort of describe to you now the work that we're trying to do, which is to understand how living systems can make nanomaterials like this. Okay. And so first what I need to do is tell you a little bit about how you make a normal scale, right, that would normally just have pigment in them, because it's modifying that that's really going to make structural color. Okay, so first of all, if you dissect out, so it, when the butterfly is a larvae, it has these structures called imaginal discs that are eventually going to form the wing. If you dissect them out of larvae, this is what they look like, and they're just a flat, they're just flat sheets of cells. And at this point, no, there's no scales or anything; they're not yet growing. Okay, um, they're just forming this flat precursor to the wing, and the scales don't start developing until they pupate. So about 12 hours or so after pupation. Then the process begins. And what happens is you end up with two sister cells, right? And one is the scale, and the other is a socket. So there's a socket that also holds the scale in place. And those are the two cells that form. And the scale cell starts to grow out of the surface of the wing. And what it does to grow out is it creates a, what's called an actin cytoskeleton. So actin is a polymer molecule that's used inside of cells that can make, that can polymerize into rods in various shapes. And there are two main molecules which was animal cells will use for their internal skeleton, and they're tubulin and actin. And it turns out that these butterfly cells use polymers of actin to make these rods of actin as their internal skeleton. And what they do is they grow that cell by extending those rods or that skeleton of actin inside of them. So here are the scales another day later, and they're growing like tiles. You're just seeing the surface, the membrane of the scale. And this is the actin inside of them. So now they've got these very highly organized rods of actin. And as time goes by, you'll see that these rods are at the edge of the cell. So the pink here is the membrane of the cell. We've sort of optically sliced through a couple of these scales. And you're seeing the membrane. And now this is the rods of actin that are all along the surface that have formed that now set up the internal skeleton of the cell and allow it to grow out. And now what's going to happen is now the pink color that you're seeing is the chitin that they're starting to secrete. And what you see is they secrete that chitin between those rods of actin. So they form that skeleton. And that's the, over time, those rods get thicker and thicker and fewer and fewer until they reach this final pattern. And now it starts to secrete that chitin material in between them. And that forms the ridges. That sets up the spacing of the ridges. And then what happens is, is now the butterfly breaks all that actin down. Because now it's got an external skeleton. It doesn't need that internal skeleton, and it starts to get rid of it. If we use drugs that depolymerize the actin, that cause the rods to fall apart, then the scales just collapse. So here's a normal development of scales. And if we add drugs that actually cause that actin to depolymerize and the rods to fall apart, the scales just collapse. Okay? If we don't add that until they've started to secrete chitin, everything's fine because they've got this external skeleton. So you only need this internal skeleton until you start to secrete the chitin, but it's very important for positioning the chitin properly. OK, so why have I told you this story? And it's really to explain to you how this green butterfly gets its green color. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this green butterfly does it and, and gets green, and then describe to you why understanding actin is important for this. So this is a, an emerald green swallowtail. Its native habitat is in Southeast Asia. We get the ones we work on from the Philippines. And unlike most butterflies, they actually do sit with their wings open. And they use this green as a camouflage color. So they're black and green. And they sit in the rainforest in the shadows. And it really works. If, you've ever, if you ever get to see them in the wild, it really works as a camouflage pattern. It breaks up their outline, and it blends into the vegetation. And they, and they blend, like I said, they blend right in. So how do they make green? So if you zoom in on one of their scales, this is what one of their scales look like. And they have these little dimples that are refracting out light. Okay? But these dimples are a multi-layer of chitin in air. Okay? So that's how they create the light refraction. But because they're curved, what happens is when white light hits the bottom of the dimple, you get constructive interference of yellow light. But when white light hits the edge of the dimple, the spacing between the, the layers is different because of the angle. 
And what happens is blue light reflects to the other side and on out. So the reason it's green is because it's yellow plus blue, right? But this is so small, this is only a few microns across, you can't possibly resolve that. So you just see it as green, even though it's separately yellow and blue light that it's shining at you. But the beauty of the system is that the blue light becomes polarized. We don't see polarized light, things like lizards don't see polarized light, but they see polarized light. So to them, they are not the color of the vegetation. So they see each other just fine, okay? But their predators don't see them, okay? So it's an ingenious sort of evolutionary solution to the problem of how you get really well camouflage, but you can still find your mates, okay? Because you can still see them. Okay, so anyway, this group of butterflies is quite remarkable because using this system, they can actually create an entire range of colors. So they can be anywhere from a purplish blue to a sort of a lemon green. And they do that um, in a variety of ways. So they can actually change the, I mean, it, not between species, if you look, they can change the shape of those dimples so that the, the properties of them are different, so they have different l properties of constructive interference, right? Um, and then there's some interesting phenomena, like you can even get variation within populations. So this Papilio carna, and it lives on a whole variety of islands in Indonesia, and on some islands it's blue, and on some islands it's green. So there's genetic variation within the populations that allows it to have variation in color. And you can even get a, a phenomenon no, known as polyphenism. So remember, the butterfly, once it's an adult, it can't change color. But this is an example of Papilio mackey. There are two generations per year, okay, a spring generation and a summer generation in Japan. And the summer generation is blue, and the spring generation is green. So depending on the temperature that you grow the larvae, the adults come out different colors, okay? Nobody knows why they're different colors, but it shows you that the environment can have an influence on the way they subsequently develop the scales. And the genome is perfectly capable of changing the optical properties of the scales to tune the colors. OK. And then finally, I'll show you this example. This is Papilio pneumogeni and Pericles. Now, if I just looked at them, I would think that they're the two most dissimilar butterflies in this group. And they normally never see each other. They're on islands 1,000 miles apart. But there are Japanese collectors that, that do amazing things with butterflies, and they can make hybrids between these. They will interbreed in the lab. And you can see that the, the one that's the hybrid actually has the pattern of this one, but has a color that's in between these two. Okay? So it's, a, it's an interesting system to try to do these studies. So what do they do to create those dimples? All right? So if you look at those green scales at this particular stage of development, they look like any typical pigmented scale. They have these nice rods of acid, which you're seeing here in yellow. But it's what they do next that's really remarkable. So when they should start breaking down the actin, so they've just started to initiate the secretion of the chitin. You're just looking at the surface of the scale. But they're going to take those rods of actin. So a typical scale would now just destroy all the actin because it's starting to make the external skeleton. And what these guys do is incredible. They take those rods of actin, and they turn them to hexagons of actin okay, inside the living cell. And they only do it to the actin that's on the top surface and not the bottom surface. Okay? So I have a lot of, and actin is one of these molecules that's intensively studied by, by cell biologists. And I show this to my cell biologist friends, and they're all like, cool, but we have no idea how you would do that. right? How do you take these rods of actin and suddenly turn them into hexagons? But we can come up with some ideas about how you might do that. So there are proteins that will generate angles off of existing rods of actin. They'll actually direct the 70 degree angles to form on the actin. So you might do something like that. Okay? And other possibilities, you can imagine that proteins could grab adjacent rods and pull them together to make them into hexagons. Okay? And other possibilities that you can make straight connections between the rods of actin and then take the whole thing and pull on it. And that would also generate hexagons. So we thought, and the we here is Ryan Null, who's a very talented graduate student in the lab who did this work. He thought, well, all we have to do is just dissect different stages of pupil development, staining for actin, and see what the intermediates look like. And the bottom line is we were never able to find any intermediates. So they just seem to magically go from one pattern to the other in a rapid transition. And we've never, we, so we couldn't see what they did. So we decided, well, the best way to do this is to watch them live, right? And to watch this. So now here's a whole other technical challenge, right? Because normally when the pattern is being formed, the pupae, you can't see into it, OK? So how can we, first of all, see into it? And so Ryan, in fact, developed a number of really fascinating techniques. So now we can grow the wings in tissue culture. So these are the wings of a blue morpho in this buckeye butterfly. 
And now they're growing outside the chrysalis. They're growing in, in culture media. And you can see the colors and patterns coming in while they're sitting in a dish. So at first we thought, well, this is great. Now we can look at this. But it turns out that we can only start the wings in culture when they're about halfway through development. And it turns out that the, all the structural color has already been made at that point. Right? It's great for looking at pigment, but not so good for looking at structural color. So we came up with another trick that allowed us to make windows into the pupae so we can see in. So what you're seeing here is a, is a butterfly pupae, and you're looking at the, at the hind wing here developing, and it's just pupated. And pupation for these animals takes about eight days. And so what you're going to see is all of wing development occurring inside, but now you can see it all. So now you, you see the wing veins, and it gets a silvery color when the scales start to form. Okay, and then towards the end of development is when it actually deposits all those pigments in, and you'll see all the pigment patterns come in in just a second. So there it goes, right? And it's fully formed, and it makes a perfectly fine wing. But now we can see into it for the whole time, right? And we're developing techniques to be able to watch that act in live inside of it. Here we hooked up a green fluorescent molecule to something that binds to the actin, so we can see in. And we're also using other molecules that can penetrate into living cells and highlight the actin. So we hope to be able to soon answer that question of how does it go from rods to these hexagons and understand how it makes those dimples and then tunes them to the right color, right? gets the right shape for the color it needs. The other approach we're taking is a genetic one. And for this, we're using these buckeye butterflies. So these are very, very common throughout all of North America. And the butterflies in North America don't have much structural color. They're mostly pigment colors, browns and yellows and oranges, a very attractive butterfly but not much in the way of structural color. But on the other hand, they're closely related to butterflies that do have lots of structural color. So this is a close relative that lives in Mexico and, and um, South America, has a nice iridescent blue on the hind wing. This is a more distant relative, and this picture I took in Japan, and these guys have a beautiful iridescent blue on them. Okay? So the buckeye in this sort of phylogenetic evolutionary tree is right here, but you can see it has plenty of relatives that have plenty of structural color. Well, it turns out that if you collect enough buckeyes in the US, occasionally you'll find some with a little bit of blue. And so what happened was there's a woman, Edith Smith, who runs a butterfly farm in Florida. And she thought, well, there's a little bit of blue. If I just take the bluer ones and I make them to each other, can I get them really blue? Okay? And after a year, she was able to make them incredibly blue. Okay? After about 12 generations of inbreeding them, she could get them back to being really very, very blue. And so what we wanted to know is, well, what did she die? How had they turned blue, right? What had happened to the scales? And so it turns out if you take off one of these blue scales and you look at it, this is from the top surface, and this is from the bottom surface. And you can see that, in fact, the blue is coming from the bottom surface. This is back on the top surface, but we've rubbed off the ridges. And it's actually the bottom, what we call the lamina of the scale, that's actually creating the color. And if we put it into oil that has the same refractive index as the chitin, you can see all the color just disappears because all of that color is a structural color. None of it is a pigment. Okay? And it turns out the way they do it is that the lamina is just the right thickness to do constructive interference of blue or constructive interference of blue light. So it's just at around 210 nanometers, which is the right thickness so that if you get reflections on the bottom and top surface, you get constructive interference of blue light. So that's what they've done. And fortunately for us, there was a theory paper that had published a few years earlier that said, well, if you made chitin of different thicknesses, what color could you get? And so what you're seeing here are the distribution wavelengths that you would get from different thicknesses. So if you're about 225 nanometers, you're kind of a turquoise blue-green. A little bit thinner, you're blue. And if you get thinner than that, you're actually gold on the second order reflection that comes. Well, how did these scales get to that thickness that they were blue? Well, it turns out if you go to the brown butterfly, right, what we started with, and you look at them, they're actually gold. So they have brown pigment in them, but the lamina is very thin, and it actually gives back this yellowish gold light. So this happens when they're about 140 nanometers thick. So what she'd done by doing that selection was actually to tune the lamina from about 140 nanometers to about 210. So they actually went from gold to being blue. Okay. And so is this what evolution had done? So this is what artificial human selection has done to make them blue. Okay? But the nice thing is we can go to these other butterflies that are naturally blue or green, and we can show that's exactly what they've done. So that's what evolution had done, too. It is that it tuned the lamina thickness to create this structural color. Okay? So, and the other thing is, well, can we watch this lamina being built? Right? So another interesting challenge of doing the live imaging. 
But I'll show you one way that you can actually know how thick the lamina is. So if you look at this set of curves, you'll notice that as the lamina gets thicker and thicker, there's actually a color progression. So it goes from yellow, from a sort of orange gold color, to a purple color, to a blue color, to a green color, OK? I'm going to take you back to this movie that I showed you before, OK? And this butterfly actually has structural color in this area of the wing. It's actually one of these blue um, buckeye butterflies. And what you're going to see is the scales already grown. So they start off orange, then they go indigo, then they go blue, right? And actually, even though you can't see it, you now know how thick the lamina is because it's being laid down progressively. And so this way, we can tell exactly where, how thick the lamina is at any given point by using that color to actually use as a readout. The other thing is because these butterflies are still very closely related to each other, right? This blue butterfly is just from a one year of selection to make it blue. We can now interbreed these butterflies, OK? And what we can do is, so what I've illustrated here is an example of a, of a if, if we imagine that we color the chromosomes from this one yellow and the chromosomes from this one blue, OK? And so there's these butterflies have 31 chromosomes, but we're just illustrating a single chromosome here. So the F1s, the, the children of those two butterflies, right, would have equal contributions from both parents, all right? But in the next generation, you mix and match pieces of the chromosome due to a phenomenon of called recombination. And in the next generation, so the grandchildren of those butterflies, right, we're going to have different combinations of the genome coming from each of the grandparents. And what we can do is we can actually look at the sequence of these butterflies. So we can ask what the color of the wings are of these butterflies. And then we can ask what regions of the genome they inherited from their brown grandparent or their blue grandparent. And then we can relate that to ask where the genes located that control whether they're brown or, or blue. Okay? And so here's what an example of what happens. So these are what the children of those look like. right? So they look mostly brown with little bits of blue. But what happens then in the next generation? In the next generation, you can get all sorts of combinations of brown and blue. Okay? And we can divide them up in two different ways. We can look at ones where, in fact, the color is the same. The iridescent color, the blue color here, is pretty much the same between all these wings. But the percentage of the wing that's covered by the iridescence is different right? in these different grandchildren. Okay? And then we can also get examples where the percentage of the wing that's covered by iridescence is the same, but we go here from indigo through blue and turquoise to green. Okay? And we can phenotype those separately. We can call those different traits. And then we can sequence the butterflies, and we can ask what parts of the genome control these traits. Okay? So this is a, a, a technique called quantitative trait locus mapping. And when we do that, so what we're going to do is we're going to genotype and phenotype these F2 grandchildren. And the student who did this, um, Rachel Fair, was quite remarkable in being able to generate really large families that were all related. So this is a, a one family here that had 501 siblings from a single pair of actually F1s and another family of 273. So that gives us a lot of mapping power. Okay? And when we do that, what we find is there, and this is just showing you different chromosomes of the animal. And then what you're seeing in this plot is basically a way of illustrating where, where there are loci, meaning genes, that have a strong influence on the percentage of the wing that has structural color. And you see that there's two areas, one on chromosome 1, and another here on chromosome 12 that play almost the entire role in determining how much of the wing has structural blue or green color. Okay? And it turns out that we actually know what one of the genes is already. So it's a gene called optics, which in Heliconius butterflies controls the red color. Okay? But in these butterflies, it seems to control the blue. And we can prove that's true by knocking out the optics gene in buckeye butterflies. And suddenly, those butterflies have blue scales. Okay, so this locus seems to be able to make a big quantum leap from brown scales to blue scales. What we don't know is what this other locus is here, what gene is under this peak. Right? And this one has an even bigger effect. So what we're trying to do now is narrow down that interval and really identify the gene that controls that. But what's really exciting is that there are about four loci that seem to control the hue. So these are genes that can control in a very fine way the precise thickness to tune it between indigo, blue, and green. And so we're really excited to know what these are. And this is a good example of using a genetic approach, where if you asked us what the genes are going to be, we have no idea what kind of genes can do this. But we know that there are four, probably four genes in the genome that have this ability to 
tune the hue of, the, of these scales. And so we're very excited to continue this work and find out what these are. Okay. And the nice thing is now there are techniques in butterflies to be able, once you have a candidate gene, you can knock them out and look at the phenotype. This is a different gene that controls other aspects of pattern, but it's just a nice illustration that this is a wild type butterfly. We can knock out one of these genes and we can see what it does to pattern. And so we'll like to, we'll, obviously that will be our approach as we identify the genes that control both the percentage of the wing, how much iridescence it has, and the hue of that iridescence is to verify that by knocking those genes out in the butterflies and seeing what the effect is. And this is using CRISPR-Cas9, the sort of genome editing technology that you've heard about mm -hmm. that works beautifully in things like butterflies and all sorts of organisms. And so I think from the, the what I'd like to then um, sort of leave you with is that we know that there are two genes that seem to have a big effect on this sort of quantal leap from these thin scales to thicker cells, scales that have this blue-green kind of iridescence. And then there are probably about four genes that really can tightly control the exact thickness to control the hue. Okay? And I'm just going to end by telling you just a little bit about one other phenomena that we studied in the lab, which is also transparency. So not a color, but a complete absence of color. And so many butterflies have actually evolved transparency. And that's another thing that we've studied. And they can be remarkably transparent. And just like with structural color, this is something that they've evolved over and over again. And so we've, we've actually been able to show that everything that you could imagine a butterfly or moth could do to try to make transparent wings, evolution has really stumbled on as a way to make transparent wings. And so this is something else that, that we're studying at the moment. So I just want to thank the people that have done all this work. So um, yeah, so this is, you know, our, we call it a parfly highly because it represents the two different things that we work on in the lab. But the, the initial characterization of the cytoskeleton of the scales, the actin and everything, was a collaboration between myself and April Dinwiddie, who's a graduate student at Yale. But we started collaborating on this project due to the embryology course at MBL, where we, we realized that we had this mutual interest in that topic. And these were some undergrads at Berkeley that were very much involved in the project. All the stuff I showed you with the, um, with the uh, peacock butterflies and the green with the dimples, that was all work by done, done by Ryan Null, a graduate student in the lab. And all the work that you saw with the buckeye butterflies is being done by Rachel Thayer, a current graduate student in the lab. And a variety of people have helped out um, in various ways in many aspects of the project. So I'm very happy to take questions. So thank okay. you very much. All right. <laughs> OK. Well. Thank you very much, Nipom. I don't think any of us will look at butterflies in quite the same way after this presentation. So I'm um, pleased um, we welcome members of the audience. Yes. Please raise your hands, and I'll come to you at the microphone. Wait for the microphone, OK, so we can all hear the question. So some of the traits has to uh, reach certain completeness. For example, the eyes, like eyes, or the like mimicking like color for the. I'm sorry, can you, I, I can't yeah. hear you quite. So I mean, some of the traits have to reach certain completeness to uh, take the effect, right? So yeah. for example, the all size and also the like mimicking colors formed by butterflies or moths. Yeah. So I was wondering how is the evolution for that trace? Because if it's like halfway there, is still not going to be helpful. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. But you can look at it in something like morpho butterflies, for example. So right, we can't know exactly the steps in evolution. But there's enough species in the group that you can look. And so the, the, the um, basal most branches of that lineage, actually what you can do is first show that they first evolved a lamina that gave them blue color. And then they elaborated it more and more to get more and more intense blue. And you can see that also in the natural selection experiments, right? Because there does seem to be some locus that can immediately give you a big transformation, right? So you can make that jump for whatever reason because of the genetic architecture fairly easily. And then you can increase the you know, penetrance of that to more and more scales. So I think you can start off by having you know, a little, like in that case, if it's blue for sexual selection, you can you know, sort of have a little bit of it, and that has some advantage, and then keep growing from there. But it's a good question, right? So how do you do some of these things? And whether you make big evolutionary jumps or you really can think of small evolu evolutionary changes the whole way. Um, and part of it is knowing in some of these things, you know, if you could recreate through selection but not human selection and actually to have a more natural selection phenomena. But obviously, as, as, every, as you well know, right, 
the issue is is that you that always takes many 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 generations and so trying to repeat that in the lab is difficult so that's the kind of thing you can do easily with bacteria and viruses and understand but with butterflies obviously that would be a real challenge anybody else anybody who's not a graduate student in my lab <laughs> okay <laughs> back there hi uh, thank you for the talk um, I was wondering about the sort of the rapid evolution of these traits that you've showed, like the s really similar heliconis that are of the same, sp that are uh, yeah. different species and then diverse among the same. Was this a problem for the taxonomists in the pre-genomic era? And um, is there sort of a mixed up, messed up taxonomy that you're fixing, or are there other morphological traits? Yeah. That so, so like between those two species, for example, right? So you look at them and you say, well, they look just the same to me, right? But in fact, the people who worked on them a long time ago were actually really, really smart. And they recognized that they were two completely different species for a number of reasons. One is, if you look really closely, there are some really subtle differences, right? But more importantly, they have very, very different life histories. So one of them, Melpomene, has this mating system where the females display on a leaf and the males come down to her. Erato has this system where the males come out first and they just wait on the female pupae and mate with her even before she gets completed out. Okay, so if you, if you know their natural history, you know they're two completely different species and they can't interbreed at all. And so I think that, you know, to their credit, a lot of the people who study these butterflies early on really had an appreciation for their life history and they immediately recognized that they were two different species and knew how to tell them apart. Is there another question? Yes. In the right, <laughs> right, okay, right here. <laughs> we'll come back to you. <laughs> In genotyping the genonia, mm -hmm. did you see any change of effect in the caterpillar? No, you know we didn't look, and 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 the two caterpillars, you know the the brown selected, the brown line and the blue selected line look exactly the same. So we wouldn't have really noticed anything. But, but the beauty of it is, is that if there had been any difference, we could actually use the same data we have to try to, tell them, try to look for genes controlling that. So you might have noticed also, for example, the eye spots are totally different sizes in the two lines. So we've actually now mapped the loci that control the eye spot size as well. And there, there are basically two major effect genes that control that. But we've, we know the loci. We don't know yet for sure the genes within that, that region. OK, back there now. Sorry, I'm giving you your exercise. That's right. great. The gentleman right there. Thank you very much for your talk. In the beginning of your talk, you were uh, uh, highlighting the role of coloration of butterfly to defend themselves from predators. And I was wondering whether climate change has any influence in the gene expression. Sorry, what climate what? change? I'm wondering if yeah. climate change has any impact on the uh, expression and the in, uh, of coloration, yeah. Yeah. and that is then linked to extinction rate of yeah. butterflies. So for some butterflies, there is this phenomena of polyphenism, so the temperature you raise them will affect the color. Okay, so that does happen, but I think the the bigger problem is most butterflies though are pretty. Um, resistant to small fluctuations in temperature as far as coloration goes. The bigger problem, of course, is their food plants are shifting and things like that, and that's probably a bigger threat to them. Yes, Teresa. Um, I was wondering how, if you, you've done any research on how the, the membrane affects their coloration, because I know if you take like a sunset moth and you take off all the scales, it still has the same colors and patterns underneath. It, it, so sunset moths don't. So, yeah, they don't. Yeah, so, so what happens is, is that in that, in that case, the scales aren't being fully pulled off. There is one beautiful example that, that, that is contrary to that. And it is a butterfly that has green on it. And it's, a, it's called Papilio Wyeski. It lives in, in New Zealand and in New Guinea. And it actually is a really unusual case where the pigment is deposited in the wing membrane instead. And they have green, and they do it with a pigment. So they have evolved a green pigment, and they put it in the wing membrane. So those ones, in fact, in the area where they have the green, they don't even have any scales. So the green is inside the membrane, and they don't cover it with scales. But that's very unusual for a butterfly. But they do do it. 
And so it shows you that there's always exceptions to any rule that you come up with. Some, some butterfly or moth figures out how to deal with it. So while we're, oh, there's a question here. But while, do you want to bring it? But I just wondered, how many of you in the audience are actual butterfly collectors and aficionados? Put your hand up, yep. just out of curiosity. OK, Very, pretty good. All right. I was just wondering if there's anyone, if you're aware of anyone doing any biomimicry with structural color coloration? Oh, yeah. So, so as I mentioned, right, and it was sort of half joking, but in fact, really a lot of the physicists that get money to do this, the whole point is because they're interested in biomimicry, right? And so there are a couple of applications that you could imagine. So for example, if you can make paints that don't fade, right? So the problem with paint is that pigment molecules degrade with time. But structural colors should be very resistant to that, depending on what you make them out of. And so there is a real interest in having paint, for example, that doesn't fade, right? The Navy would love not to have to repaint ships all the time, things like that, right? Um, so, but, there, but there, are other, there are other uses that people come up with. Like, it turns out that, like, remember how, like, I showed you that if you put acetone on the morpho wing, it goes green. Well, actually, color is something that you can very, very accurately detect, right, with a spectrophotometer, right? And so it turns out that you can actually use the wing of a morpho to detect incredibly low concentrations of solvents in the air, because it causes very slight shifts in the wavelength of light, which are very easy to measure. And so there's some strange application, I mean, things that I wouldn't have thought of. And there's also things like, well, people have said, well, if you could make money that was colored by structural color, you couldn't just photocopy it, right? Um, and things like that. So. And, and but that's the kind of thing. Well, right now it costs so much money to do that; it's not worth the to print it. But and there's and there's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of interest in designing nanomaterials to deliver drugs into cells. But if you could make them biologically, of course, they would be much safer than if you were making them chemically. Yeah. Linger. <laughs> Thanks, Nepal. I was wondering, can you explain the behavior of that? Butterfly to go forward and ba back and. Can I explain the behavior? How does it develop that behavior? Yeah. I mean, and it's and it doesn't have to learn it, right? It's just the way what? it lands. It doesn't make it go forward and then goes backwards and turns. No, no, no. So forward. it no, sorry. What Can it you does is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Demonstrate it. <laughs> it. Sorry if I confuse you about that. So what happens is as it's. As it's about to land, while it's still in the air, it rotates 180 degrees in the air and lands backwards, and then runs backwards. Right? Oh, that's much clearer. Yeah, that's much clearer. <laughs> but why? I mean, it, it, you just watch it, and you're like, this is crazy. Now you really can't tell the head from the tail. Right? OK, any last pressing questions? So I think we really need to give Nipom a big round of applause. <laughs> and, and we also want to thank you all for attending our neighborhood science lecture. And we look forward to seeing you again at the next one. So good night. Great talk. Thanks for the